storm. He's in the valley we walk through. Where two or three are gathered in his name, you'll be there too. When you feel so all alone, he is standing next to you. He's with us now. Our Lord, He's in the midst. As you travel down life's road, He is with you every day. With every step you take, He's walked ahead of you. And every night as you lay down, Angels are camping all around. I'll never be alone, for He is in the midst. He's in the midst of our storm. He's in the valley we walk through. Where two or three are gathered in His name, You'll be there too when you feel so all alone. He is standing next to you. He's with us now. Our Lord, He's in the midst. Into the prisons they were thrown. Paul and Silas weren't alone. They knew that God was there, and He would see them through. So when the walls began to shake, and all their chains just fell away, they cried, Behold our God, for He is in the midst. He's in the midst of our storm he's in the valley we walk through where two or three are gathered in his name he'll be there too when you feel so all alone he is standing next to you he's with us now our lord He's in the midst. He's with us now. Our Lord, He's in the midst. Appreciate that good song. Appreciate Sister Beth singing that. Again, appreciate you being here tonight. I want you to turn your. Uh, we tried this last week out of this text, and I'll be honest with you, I got a complete different message out of Second Chronicles chapter 17 than I did last week. So I don't know if the Lord will let me work on that in some point or the other, but anyhow, the Lord's directed our heart here tonight. Second Chronicles chapter number 17 again. I've learned through the years. Never to, or to try not to question the Lord, the direction He sends us. I'll be honest with you tonight. Can I just, well, I always like being open. I pretty am. Most of the time you pretty much know where I stand when I get up here. But I'll tell you what, I'd love to be able to preach on heaven tonight. I would. But the Lord ain't going to let me do that. And the Lord stirred our heart here out of Second Chronicles, chapter number 17. I think I said Sunday. And I'd say this again tonight, I didn't come to be a hurt or a hindrance, I come to be a help, and I come to be a blessing. And all I can do is mind the Lord, and it's His Word, and I just pray that it'll help us as we draw closer unto the Lord. But if you found your place in Second Chronicles chapter number 17, if you would stand with us tonight in honor and reverence to the reading of the Word of God. Second Chronicles chapter number 17, as we finished up. In chapter number 16, Asa, uh, of course, he's died, and now his son is reigning in his stead. There's a man by the name of Jehoshaphat that we're getting ready to read about, 
And he's the great, great, great grandson of King David. Now the Bible said in verse number 1 of Second Chronicles chapter 17, And Jehoshaphat his son reigned in his stead, and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed forces in all the fit cities of Judah, and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. Now, you might say, well, why was the Lord with him? Well, read on in that verse. Because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and sought not unto Balaam. Now, if you want to know the title of last week's message that I thought I was going to get to preach, it was be walking in the first ways of your father. But look at verse 4. This is the message for tonight. This is what Jehoshaphat did. But sought to the Lord God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as I bow in your presence, God, one more time, being reminded, Lord, that you are in the midst. And, Father, I'm thankful you said in your word where two or three are gathered together. You'd be there. And, uh, Father, I sure do need you tonight. I pray that you'd come help your servant. I pray that you'd just uh, help this feeble body touch this voice. God, it's your message you placed upon our heart. Father, I pray that you'd give us a love. And, Lord, I love this people here. I pray that they'd be listening ears tonight. Lord, that they'd hear what thus saith the word of God. I pray if there's one in our assembly tonight that may have came in those doors. Maybe they've never been saved. God, I realize it's Wednesday night. But, God, we know that you said in your word that today is a day of salvation. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would have free reign in this service. God, I ask, Lord, that you'd remove every hindrance, and anything that would distract us, Lord, from focusing in on the Word of God. I pray that Jesus may have the preeminence in this service. I'm just your servant, and God, without you, we can't do a thing. And I pray that you'd come help us, be in the midst, and we'll thank you, and we'll praise you for what's accomplished and done. But we ask it in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. <clears throat> we'll get one more round. Second Chronicles chapter 17, we read, about a man, and some folks may call him Jehoshaphat, some may call him Jehoshaphat, and I may call him uh, one or the other during tonight's message. But anyhow, this particular fellow, again, the great-great-grandson of King David. Here we find in verse number 4 that he sought unto the Lord, and not after Balaam, which in all the false religions in the, of the day, he sought after the Lord, and he followed the Lord. Tonight, to get your mind going where I want it to go, and I think Christy's back there with Miss Gracie. She's probably listening in on that TV. And she's probably going to kill me when we get home. But i I got to just uh, just to sort of get you where I'm going. Garrett will remember this. Many of you have been up to Stone Mount. Probably all of us have at some point or the other. There's a place up there that's called Widow Falls. Now, Widow Falls is, I, I don't believe we've ever been to the top. But there's a place right there you walk up into that's, that's where all the kids play. And there's just a natural funnel where the kids would get on the rocks and slide down. Well, Garrett was about maybe three, some, maybe he might have been four. But I remember we were going up there that day, and, and we were playing in the creek, and man, them creek rocks, you know, is slick. And he was barefooted, and he wanted to go up there where all the other kids, the bigger kids, was up there playing. I said, I don't think that's a good idea. And I remember, and listen, Christy wouldn't hurt him for a thing in the world. Just let me go ahead and throw that out there. But she said, and, and he said, well, all the other kids are doing it. All the other kids are up there playing around. So anyhow, they went on, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm counting backwards from 10 to see how long it took him to fall when he got on them rocks. Because I knew that I couldn't even stand up on it. And I think I got to about 8, counting back from 10 by the time he got up there, and his little feet got the pattern, and boom, right on the back of his head he went. And just cracked his old head I could have bit a nail into. Now you say, preacher, what, what's that got to do with the message tonight? Well, the statement was made, all the other kids are doing it. And I'm going to tell you something, folks, and our young people, everybody, this is tonight's message for everybody, and it's from the Lord. You know what? We don't need to do what everybody else is doing. Amen. Tonight, if I could preach on a message, it's simply being, being abnormal in a normal society. Now, when I say abnormal, I'm talking about godly. Because, folks, I'm going to tell you, we're living in a godless country. 
We're living in a godless society. I realize we're in the Bible Belt of America, and I'm thankful for the heritage right here. we still got some folks that stand for the principles on the Word of God. But I'm saying as a whole, folks, we're in a minority, and the majority is heading down that broad road. I would ask you the question. I know you, the answer. If I were to ask you, is the Bible true? And you'd say, well, certainly it is. I hope you would, because it is, whether you believe it or not. But listen to what the Bible said in Matthew chapter 7. And you know this verse well. It says in verse 13 through 14, and listen to this now. This is what the Bible said. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now the Bible is true. And according to the Word of God, many, that's the majority of the folks that we come in contact with are on the broad road to destruction that leads to a place called hell. Few are on that narrow way. Now, you can argue about this, that, and the other, but the Bible's true, and folks, it's up to date today more than it's ever been. It's always been right on time for the occasion. But we know that many are heading down that road. And those many are what we would classify as the normal folks today. But you know what? We need to be abnormal in a normal society. And I, when I say abnormal, I'm talking about living a godly life before others. You know what I sincerely desire to do is to live a Christ-honoring life. I want to be a Christ-honoring husband. I want to be a Christ-honoring servant to the Lord first. I want to be a Christ-honoring husband that, that, that is there with my wife. We're, we're co-workers together. And again, she's going to whip me after a while, I know but to be the best, the God, Christ-honoring dad that I can be, the Christ-honoring pastor that I can be, the best that I can be according to my ability, and let God do the rest. But understand this, every person in here, we have a choice if we're just going to run with the crowd or we're going to be different. Now, I've made this statement many times, and you can understand this. If you go down to the river, and if you jump in, you try to swim up, up the river, man, it's tough doing that. Now, if you get in and you swim with the flow, it ain't too bad at all. It don't take much effort at all to go with the flow. But it takes some effort to cut against the grain to go upstream. And I'll tell you, and I'm thankful there's some folks, praise God, that have chose not to go with the flow, but they're going upstream. There's something to be said, being abnormal in a normal society. Now, tonight you say, preacher, and there's just three simple things. <laughs> you say, preacher, how can I live a Christ-honoring life? How can I do that? There's three simple things. Number one, and, and folks, listen, young people, there ain't nothing more important tonight than what I'm telling you. You may feel like that I'm off target. You may feel like that I'm just an old fogey and don't know anything. Let me tell you something. I was your age one time, and I thought I knew everything, and nobody else knew nothing. But as I got older, I got to realize, you know what, boy, that preacher was right. You better listen with those spiritual ears tonight. How can I be abnormal in a normal society? How can I honor Christ with my life? Number one, it's a word called abstinence. You say, what's that mean? That means to keep away from certain things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 22 said, Abstain from all appearance of evil. Didn't say part of it, didn't say some of it. If it looks like a rat, if it smells like a rat, by golly, it's a rat. And the Bible said, stay away from that stuff. You know how alcoholics start? One drink. You know how drug addicts start? One, just one time. Again, that stuff they're going around with that crystal meth right now, you take it one time, and the drug push pushers know this, and they get into the schools, and they let them take it one time, and they're hooked for life. But if you never mess with it, you don't have to worry about it. Abstaining. How can I live a Christ-honoring life? By abstaining, keeping away from those things. What preacher everybody else is doing. Listen, folks, that's what I'm trying to tell you tonight. Be abnormal and be godly in a godless society. Understand, abstaining from things. Cut against the grain. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3 through 4. What else should we abstain from? Listen to this. The Bible said, for this is the will of God. If you don't know what the will of God is, listen. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. That word sanctification is being set apart for the master's use. 
That word sanctified means he set us apart. And this is the will of God, that you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. And when you think about the word fornication, it comes from the Greek word pornea, which we get pornography from in the English today. And folks, when it comes down to this fornication, it's all types of illicit sex. Now, some of you ain't old enough to understand that, and that's all right, but some of you are. And I'm telling you, you better stay away from it. There ain't no safe sex whatsoever. God said stay away from it. There's a lot of folks say, well, I'm not going to do it because I, I don't want to get pregnant. I don't want to get some kind of disease. That should not be your motivation as a child of God. You should stay away from it because God said keep away and abstain from fornication. And some of you are saying, boy, that preacher, he don't know nothing. Then you've been where you're at. You better stay away from it. And abstain from it. Be abnormal. Everybody else is doing it, preacher. Well, listen, if everybody goes out here and sticks their head up underneath the tire and runs over, I'm not going to do that. And you shouldn't either. Just because everybody else is doing it, cut against the grain and abstain. Listen to this, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Said, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain, that's again, keep away from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Now tune me in right here, don't tune me out, just raise that radar up real high right here for just a minute. Some of you, no doubt in my mind, with the crowd that we've got here tonight, I don't know everybody's situation, I don't go home with you, I'm just a delivery boy, but some of you, no doubt in my mind, you're dabbling in some things that you shouldn't be dabbling in. You're listening to the devil's music with rock and roll and rap. And listen, folks, I'm going to tell you, country is more ungodly than a lot of those other things. Amen? Because they promote sex, adultery, drug use, alcohol. They promote all of those things. And you, as a child of God, shouldn't be listening to that mess and bringing that into your mind because folks you're incapable of growing spiritually if you allow that mess to go in your mind incapable of it abstain from it listen that type of music has no listen no, no reason to even be in your vehicle but you know what we ought to have we ought to have some CD burners well preacher everybody else is doing it I'm calling you out to be abnormal be godly in a godless society that's what we need today Again, say, preacher, this ain't real popular. I probably won't get the popularity content. That's all right. I just want to honor God tonight. This is the message. Again, I'd love to preach on heaven, but this is the message of the hour that God tells us to, in order to live a Christ-honoring life, we need to abstain from some of these things. How many of you would go and, and get dirt and sand and, and water and pour into your gas tank into your car? You'd say, well, that's crazy because it'd mess everything up. When you put all that junk in your mind, that's why the Bible said in the book of Philippians chapter number 4, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, think on these things. But when you get all that junk inside of you, just like it would mess up a car, honey, it'll mess you up. And it'll cause you to be incapable of growing spiritually in the Lord by what you take in with the ears or with the eyes. You say, preacher, hey, I, I can go home and I can get on the internet and I can look on whatever I want to look at and nobody knows, friend. I'm going to tell you, there's a God in heaven that knows about it. So abstain. You want to live a Christ-honoring life, abstain from the... You know what true character is? True character is what you do when nobody else is looking. That's a true test of character. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, ears, what you hear. I'm calling you to be, and God calls us to be abnormal in a normal society. Not only do we, how can we live a Christ-honoring life by abstinence, by keeping away. But number two, and I told you just three, and I'm going to be quick as I can be. But I want you to know the second thing that you can live a Christ-honoring life in is your appearance. Amen. What's the old saying, a book is worth, a, or a picture is worth a thousand words? And you know what, by our appearance... When we go out of here, listen, we ought to reflect Christ in everything we do. Everything we do. You hang tight with me just a minute. Listen to this. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Don't turn me out yet. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9 and 10. Now this was in, now if you go on down, you look at 1 Timothy, you look at 2 Timothy, and you look at Titus. That is in reference to how we're to behave ourselves in the house of God. Now this was in reference to the women, but you hang on, fellas, because I'm coming around to you here in just a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9 and 10, it said, In like manner also, 
that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. You say, surely we ain't going there tonight, preacher. Oh, yeah, if you want to live a Christ-honoring life, this is something that is necessary. With shamefacedness, what's that? That is, that's modesty. And sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. The idea of that text is, is not to bring attention to yourself. Ladies, can I speak to you just a moment? And I want you to look up here and and listen, I ain't looking at you. I don't know what anybody's got on right now. It really don't matter at this particular point. But I want you to understand something. When you look, when folks look at you, they'll pass judgment on you. Now you go back, I know, and you can take me to the verse over there in Samuel where God looks on the heart, but that is a fact. But the truth is man looks at us and they already pass judgment. And folks, it's important for you young ladies to dress modestly. Now, if I got up here and I said, fellas, you got to wear a three-piece suit. Ladies, you got to wear a dress that drags the floor. I believe I'd be wrong, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm in the book tonight, and the Bible said that you and I need to be modest in our appearance. Why, preacher? Because it honors Christ. Well, preacher, how do we define that? Well, folks, if it's too short where you got to pull it down, it's too short. If it's too low where you got to pull it up, it's too low. Amen. I remember when we were down there, I was working with the youth. And I tell you, I I learned to appreciate things real, real quick. Because working with those young people and those little girls wanted to come in with those, and they called a skirt, but they'd be cut off. And man, I'm going to tell you, that does not honor Christ, by the way. You know what they always told me? I ain't even going to tell you. <clears throat> I don't believe the Lord had me say that tonight. But I do know this. Folks, when you got young people and you got older, we got enough distractions as there is. You come into the house, and we're, let's just focus on the house of God for just a moment. You come in, you got a 15, 16 year old boy that's lost and undone without God, or maybe he's saved, but he might not be spiritually mature. It don't take much, and listen, your flesh just like I am, those young fellas, they're easily distracted when they see women. And folks, listen, what I'm simply trying to say to you young ladies is honor God in your appearance and listen, cover up, amen. Now, fellas, I told you I was coming over to you. You hang on just a minute. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5 says this. Said the women shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. You know what God's saying right there? And, and this is so true, and I'll be honest, we, we need to be abnormal in a normal society. We need to be godly in a godless society. You know what that verse is cer- certainly saying? Is from a distance a man ought to look like a man, and from a distance a woman ought to look like a woman. Amen. I'll be honest with you nowadays. Can't hardly tell. I ain't mad. Listen, I ain't mad at you. I ain't upset. I'm just a delivery boy, and I'm simply telling you that yes, we can honor Christ by abstaining from some things, but by our very appearance, folks, I'm going to tell you, we can honor Christ. Now listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. We can honor the Lord in our peers. Now, I ain't got to worry about the long hair, let me tell you. That come out when I started preaching. But a man ought to look like a man, and a woman ought to look like a woman. Can I get a witness in the house of God? Now tonight, you say, preacher, why is that important? Because I'm telling you, our society is drifting further and further and further and further away from the Lord. But let me go ahead and tell you this too. Somebody asked me, I don't go, preacher, what do you think about a man wearing an earring? Listen, an earring on a man is feminine. You can go all the way back. Where did that come from, preacher? It come from the land of Canaan, from the Canaanites. It also came from Egypt, which is a type of the world. I'm going to tell you, if you want to honor Christ, men, you will not have an earring in your ear. Amen. That's another message on down the road, but while we're on it, I thought I'd hit it in passing. So understand tonight 
You say, and folks, I'm going to tell you, it's not, it's not a funny subject because I'm telling you, there's folks that are drifting to the left and drifting to the right saying, it don't matter what I look like. It don't matter what I do. I'm saved by the grace of God. Friend, that's a dangerous thing because the Bible called, he said, hey, he calls us to be holy and he's holy. Now, we'll never reach that, that plateau of holiness until we're with him. But he's going to perfect us one day, but we're to strive for, for perfection. What I'm telling you tonight is hard because a lot of your buddies and a lot of your friends are doing all these things and you're seeing them and you want to be cool and you want to be liked by everybody. But folks, I encourage you tonight, certainly look in and, and try to honor Christ with everything you do and He'll bless you tremendously, exceedingly, and abundantly for honoring Him. You understand tonight, abstinence is how we can honor Christ. In our appearance, it's how we can honor Christ. But number three, by our attitude, we can honor Christ. And you say, preacher, where does our attitude start with? It starts with our relationship with God. You know what? If your attitude ain't right with God, then everything else is going to be downhill. Or uphill, I should say. But think about this. There's a lot of folks. There's a lot of young people. There's a lot of middle-aged people. A lot of folks that's going through life, and they don't know Jesus as their Savior. And there's a sense of pride in them that'll say, well, I don't have to do this and I don't have to do that. And they got that old rebellious spirit and sad to say it's going to drag some of them to hell because they won't put that pride aside and trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And folks, that's the only way you and I can be set free. Listen, I ain't preaching down to you. Listen, I'm where you's at. If you're here tonight and you've never been saved, you're going to have to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God that He can exalt you in due time and realize you're a sinner and call on the name of the Lord. And I promise you, if you come with a repentant spirit and you trust Christ, folks, I'm going to tell you, He'll save you and He'll change your life. But you're still going to battle with this flesh. You're still going to battle with this, because this flesh ain't saved. My, my soul is saved. This flesh is just as wicked as the day I got saved. But you know what Paul said? He said, I'm crucified with Christ. <laughs> Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Preacher, how can we live a victorious life in Christ? We can't do it apart from him. Came and read the text the other night up there in John chapter 15. It, it, without me, ye can do nothing. But with him, we can do all things. And we can conquer that flesh. And we can beat it down. But you've got to understand, how can I honor Christ? Your attitude, number one, to God. Now, some folks have the idea, well, it's my body. I can do with it what I want to. I beg your pardon. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19 through 20 asks the question, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Now this is speaking to believers. Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Then he tells us something, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You say, preacher, when did God purchase me? When did he buy me? I'll tell you, on that old rugged cross, Jesus hung between heaven and earth. Suffered, bled, and died. Why did he do it? He done it for a sinner like me. He done it for a sinner like you. And our attitude needs to be right with a holy God, first of all. Then second of all, our attitude toward our parents. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. said, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. You know what the hardest thing that, that, I, that I had to deal with, and I've shared this with you quite often. When I was pastoring in Wilkes, dealing with the Ebenezer Garden Christian Children's Home, those little kids would come in, and they would roll up their sleeves, and they had scars all over their arms where their mom and dad would burn them when they were children because they wouldn't quit crying. Some of them were verbally abused. Some of them were mentally, sexually abused. And they dealt with that. And then you deal with the subject right here. And you say, preacher, how in the world could they honor their parents when they've done something like that? You don't honor their actions. You honor their place. It's sort of like government officials. We'll get on that here in just a moment. 
There's a place. Listen, we honor the, the senators. We honor their place. We honor the presidency. That don't mean that we agree with all of their decisions because those that don't honor God, we stand opposed in opposition to. But the Bible tells us to honor our father and our mother. And it comes with a, the first commandment of promise that our life may be long upon the earth. Now, folks, I don't know. If you had a Christian home, you ought to be thankful. And I'm sure some of you talk to your mom and dad in ways that wouldn't even be decent to even bring up in here. Do you know what God tells us to do? To honor our father and mother. Obey them. Not just question them and nag them time and time. When they tell you something, you ought to do it. Well, I had, mom and dad had a good way of not having to ask me about once. I didn't get too, they didn't beat me to death. Mom was in here tonight. But they weren't afraid to whip me. <laughs> you ought not be afraid to whip them. Because folks, I'm going to tell you, if they run over you, they're going to have a tough life. Because you see, not only do they need to have a right attitude, you and I need to have a right attitude with God. We need to have a right attitude with our parents. But number three, we need to have a right attitude with others. You're going to live in this life, and, and, and parents, if you don't teach your children, if you don't correct them, if you don't discipline them, I know they look precious, and I know they look harmless, but I promise you they'll turn into monsters one of these days. Amen. You say, you call little Johnny a monster? I'm telling you, he will be. Spare the rod and spoil the child. God made something back here on the seat of knowledge. Just a lot of education goes on back here. God put some cushion back here, and it's all right to whip them. I, so, I know some of you kids probably don't like to hear that. But you know what? God does the same thing to us when we step out of line. God chastens us. If you're living in sin, you say, I'm a child of God, but God don't chasten me. You better check up and make sure you are a child. Because he chastens whom he loves. Tonight, think about this, our attitude toward parents. Attitude toward others. You say, preacher, I'm saved by the grace of God, but somebody else over here, and they may be a believer, but maybe they've hurt you or something, and boy, you've got a grudge, and you're holding that grudge against them, and just won't let it go. Just keep digging it up. Just keep scratching around, and I keep digging down in that old wound. You know what God says to do? If you want to honor Him with our attitude, listen, it needs to be right with God. It needs to be right with our parents, but number three, it needs to be right with others. Ephesians 4, and verse 31 and 32 Listen to these first four or five words all have to deal with anger. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. Six words that go all the way back to the basic meaning of the word anger. And it said, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And then he tells us how. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. If you're forgiven, if I'm forgiven, you know what God calls us to do? It calls us to forgive folks. But preacher, you don't know what they've done to me. No, I don't. But I know this, they did not nail you to a cross on Calvary. But Jesus was hung between heaven and earth, and yes, He was the perfect Son of God, but He left that example behind us. The very first words from the cross, they were seven cries, but the very first one, He looked down on that, that crew that, or those folks that just had crucified Him and spit upon Him and mocked on Him, and there He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's tough, folks. I ain't preaching something easy tonight because it's hard. Well, everybody else is holding a grudge. Everybody else is doing this. Everybody else is doing that. Be abnormal in a normal society. Be godly in a godless society. Then our attitude not only to God but to our parents, to one another, but to those in authority. Now, this is what I'm talking about while I go about parents. Why is it so important to instruct your children and to discipline them and to see the authority there in the home? Because if they don't learn it in the home, as they get older, they're never going to respect authority anywhere else. Teachers, talking about that the other day, we got, I know Sister Chandler and Sister Beth, I know they're in the teaching profession, and God bless you, that was all I can do. I couldn't do it. They asked me not long ago, I seen Ricky Oates down there, and he's over the, the school bus deal here in Yakin County. He said, Brother Brian, what? I was eating with Gary Lawson down there at Reese's. 
He said, Brother Brown, will you pass him full time? I said, yeah. He said, man, we need you to drive a bus. I said, are you crazy? I said, he said, hey, you, you can, he said, you can take one day, two days, three days. I said, Ricky, are you crazy? I said, you ever seen them people on TV that get arrested for, for doing crazy things? I said, that'd be me by the time somebody told me or some of those little kids got on me and told me to shut my mouth or cuss me. I probably would have exercised some discipline and then I'd have been in trouble. But I'm serious, you bus driver, you teachers. You know what? When I was growing up, I knew I better respect them because when I got back home, I would have got it there too. I think if you, if we, and I don't think we talked about this, but I believe you could ask any of the teachers. And if you were to ask them, what's the biggest problem? I don't think they'd say, a lot of them might say the kids, but their parents are probably worse than their youngins. Well, I can't believe little Johnny would do this. I don't think we got any little John. That's why I try to get a generic name. Because <laughs> I sure ain't singling nobody out. But you know what I'm saying? They'll sigh, they, I just can't believe my little darling, my, my little baby would be like that, probably because they run over you the whole time. Amen. Authority. Government officials. Police officers. I mean, people spit on officers and, and try to cause, man, I was scared, I'm still scared of them. They'll write you 300 or they'll write you a check and it'll cost you several hundred dollars, or not a check. They'll write a ticket. It'd be nice if they wrote us a check. But they'll give, us a, they'll give us a ticket, and then to get out of that mess, you've got to pay a boatload of money. But I learned to respect those folks because God's placed them there. Even our governors, our senators, House of Representatives, our president, so on and on and on. You know what God ordained them? We don't have to agree, but we have to respect that position. God's called us to. Even when they stand opposed to what we believe. God causes us to honor, to honor that place of leadership. Well, preacher, everybody else is bashing this and everybody else is bashing that. I'm calling you out to be abnormal in a normal society. Listen to what the Bible said in Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. That's where it originated from. The powers that be are ordained of God whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. You see, when it comes to the proper order, you've got to have a proper respect of God and they ought to be a sense of awe and they ought to be a sense of fear. If you ain't afraid of God, well, I'm going to tell you, you better check up too. God can take us out here right now. If you ain't saved, you better get saved. You better trust Christ because the Bible says it's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But understand our relationship with them. Number one, our relationship to our parents. But you see, if that's out of order, you're never going to show the right respect. You're not going to honor your teacher. You're not going to honor your bus drivers. You're not going to honor those in, in position. And get this. There is going to come a time when you're going to have to work. The Bible said if you don't work, we hand you out and not eat. There's going to come a time when you have to work, and if you don't own your own business, somebody's going to be giving you commands, and you're going to have to respect that authority. Preacher, why is that important? In today's world, everything I believe that I've hit on tonight, as the Lord gave me, people are just going down this, this, this straight over, this old slippery slope. God calls us to be abnormal, to be different in this crowd in this world. Tonight, a sister Linda comes. God just wanted me to come by and remind you tonight, we need to be abnormal, be godly in a normal or a godless society. How can we do that, preacher? We can do that by abstaining from these things. We can do it by our appearance and by our attitude as we stand our feet all over the house. Let's pray. Father, I sure do love you tonight, and I've done my best, Lord, to deliver the message of the hour. Father, I thank you for helping us, and I pray, Lord, that the words would just fall on good, fertile soul. God, I want to be a help, Lord, to every person that's under the sound of our voice, God, that those that may be listening in down the road, I pray if there's one in our assembly tonight or listening, God, that's never been saved. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would prick their heart. God, show them their need of a Savior while there's still time and opportunity. Jesus is the only way. God, help them to walk the aisle tonight, God, if they're here. Help them to put that pride aside. But God, I pray for the child of God. 
maybe some young folks, maybe some older folks here tonight that's dealing with some things or that they shouldn't be dealing with. God, help them to live a Christ honoring life. God, I desire to be the man that you've called me to be. I want to honor you. I pray that that be our desire as we leave this place. God, not just challenge us, Lord. I pray that we'd leave here not just challenged but changed. And God, we'll thank you. I'll praise you for what's done during this invitation time, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I think right now is the most critical time of the service. Tonight I'd ask you what part of your life do you lack control over? Or are there some areas in your life that are just completely out of control? Are you fully submitted to the Lord? You live in a Christ-honoring life? Would you be considered abnormal? One that cuts against the grain? Yes, they can look at your life and say, Man, he's a child of God. He's different. Or would they look at us and say, Well, he just like everybody else. She just like everybody else. Can folks tell that you're a child of God? I think another question to be asked, if you and I were to go on trial for being a child of God, would there be enough evidence to convict us of being a Christian. 